Jazakallah khair for reminding us that a superordinate goal, a goal that we all can agree on, is what leads to the outcome of unity. We can't just say, we're going to do a unity talk. It's all about action. Thank you for reminding us. You see, they recently came up with this concept called We the North. Anybody heard of it? Show of hands. You're all basketball fans, right? But it didn't start off as a basketball thing. It started off as a unity project to unite people in Canada on something specific, we the North. Now, if we want to think about a united Canada, we have to, we must take what the Sheikh spoke about into the sincerest of considerations. If it's going to be a united Canada, what do we need to be doing? See, because there's a difference between being marginalized and being isolated. If you don't want to have anything to do with your own people and nothing to do with society, that's marginalization. But integration is, as he said, maintaining your identity fully and participating in society. So, thank you, Sheikh. The Sheikh will be out in the back for Speaker's Corner. If you have any questions, he'll be there for about 20 minutes, inshallah. Now... Our next speaker, we know very well. We've seen him in Calgary multiple times. He's the type of imam that parents say, you should be more like him. And he's the type of imam that youth say to their parents, you should listen to him. He's a bridge between the two. And not because of, mashallah, his extensive knowledge but it's his experience. He has over 10 years of process to lead to this outcome. He is more than credible when it comes to the Quran and the Ahadith. After studying, he came back to Canada. After studying in Medina, he came back to Canada to start what I believe is a lifelong trajectory of answering the difficult questions. My son the other day asks me, how old is Allah? <laughs> now, what do I do? I put on my most intellectual mindset and I said, you know what? Allah doesn't have an age. So he says to me, so he's zero? <laughs> now, how am I supposed to define infinity, no beginning, no end to a five-year-old? Cognitively, psychologically, he cannot process abstract things. Much like so many of us who receive those questions from community members, from leaders, from friends, from colleagues, from children themselves, and we cannot answer it. Thank God for Ask Musleh. Because any question you have can be forwarded to him through his uh, video series. So he's a MashaAllah, alhamdulillah, a valuable resource. Now, if you're wondering how to answer any question a child asks that you get frustrated and flustered with, simple. Four words that any counselor will tell you is perhaps the most powerful four words. When he says, how old is Allah? Now, some of us would say, well, you should tell him, innahu al-awwal wal-akhir wal zahir wal batin but he doesn't understand awwal and akhir. He doesn't understand first and last. Doesn't understand no age. So I said these four powerful words that I hope you can take away with you. They are, what do you think? So I get to understand his thought process. Sheikh Muslih Khan, youngest, one of the youngest imams in Canada. Perhaps, and again, I, I don't want to uh, make him feel uncomfortable or anything or pressure, but the pressure is on because I do believe even the elderly imams are looking to him for answers. Our youth are looking to him for answers. Please welcome with sincere dua our Sheikh Muslah Khan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, it sounds like all of you are hungrier than me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah. I'm going to begin with a very short recitation, inshaAllah ta'ala. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويوم يعض الظالم على يديه يقول يا ليتني يقول يا ليتني اتخذت مع الرسول سبيلا يا ويلتا ليتني لم اتخذ فلانا خليلا لقد اضلني عن الذكر بعد اذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للانسان خذولا وقال الرسول يا رب ان قوم اتخذوا هذا القران ان قوم اتخذوا هذا القران مهجورا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على تمان لأكملان خير خلق الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا بما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد My brothers and sisters So I've just recited selected verses from Surah Al-Furqan and my title for you I believe it's called why we can't be friends and uh, this title is extremely important not just for the young people for anybody especially if you call yourself a believer from a spiritual aspect it is just as important and at as any other practical or logical aspect but what I'm going to do is I want to address with you some of the spiritual bankruptcies when we're choosing friends. So there are going to be two areas that I would look at insha'Allah. Number one is the whole concept of gender interaction. So can guys be friends with girls vice versa? And then the second aspect of the topic really is the kinds of friends that we choose. So we see or want to see good in them, but the reality is they can disrupt your entire life. As the Messenger والسلام, once told us that you are upon the deen, upon the path of your friends. My mother always used to tell me the same thing, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And this is actually one of the ways that I learned to, to choose proper friends. I actually learned that discipline from my mother. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by talking to you a little bit about how Muslims approach the religion of Islam. Usually when it comes to us wanting to practice our deen, many Muslims fall under, under two major categories in terms of their approach to the religion. You have what I call the first category, which are the conservative Muslims. These are the Muslims that are in Islam for all the acts of worship. They pray, they fast, they go and make hajj. They're always in the masjid. They grow their beards. They wear their hijabs. They are in the Islam and they're in it to stay. There's just one problem with that. Look at some of their friends. Some of their friends are terrible. Look at the way they treat their families. The guy can't give his wife her mahar, and he's been married to her for 25 years. There's all these bankruptcies in their lifestyle, aside from the spiritual aspect. So, they are amazing Muslims, but they're struggling to be good people. They're not patient, they lose their anger, you can't trust them, you can't do business with them. So that's the first category. Then you have the second category of Muslims, when I say this, I say this again, it's a generalization, not every single Muslim is like this, which is what I call the ultra-liberal Muslims. Now these are the Muslims that, mashaAllah, they are amazing people, you can trust them, you can hand them the keys to your house, 
you can give them everything in this world and know that they will carry it or return it back to you just the way they've received it. The only problem is, is they say to themselves, well, I'm a good person, so why do I need to pray five times a day? Why do I need to practice all of these things? Why do I have to fast? It's summertime. Why am I going to do all of that? I'm a good person. So they are amazing people struggling to be good Muslims. Now, having said that, always remember that our religion causes the individual or calls an individual to be both of these things. You can't be one without the other. You need both to be a complete Muslim. Where am I getting this from? Do you remember who the Messenger والسلام, was before he was a prophet? Do you remember and read all the stories of what kind of individual he was when he interacted with people? You could do business with him. You could trust him. I mean, subhanAllah, one of the most famous titles given to him before prophethood was the trustworthy one, Al-Ameen. He was also called a Salih. And I'm kind of proud that he was also called a Muslih. So he had all of these wonderful titles attached to him before he started that deep spiritual journey of becoming a prophet. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed him as a human being. And so the first lesson for all of us, when you're going to approach this topic or this practice in life called friendship, then you first need to know and need to understand where you stand as a Muslim. Because when you know that, then you know what you're going to look for and want to achieve out of that friendship. You're not just going to be an individual that anybody who gives you a little bit of attention, you're like, oh my God, can I be your friend? You're not gonna do those things you're always going to be critical of yourself because you want to surround yourself with people who are better than you. Better than you in what sense? Intellectually, uh, socially, whatever the case is. Somehow there are a couple extra pluses on their side and that's beneficial to you. And then as the friendship progresses, then they realize that, mashallah, you also have some qualities that I want to work on as well. So you begin to inspire each other. One of the first and most critical ways that you will learn and know you have a good friend is that both of you can inspire each other to feel good about yourselves. You inspire one another that regardless of what your state is, you can still be better. So you don't point fingers and call each other idiots all day and point out each other's mistake. But even if the other person is lagging in something they should be strong in, the other friend is always there and say, bro, I know you're not like them, man. Come on. Is that how you talk to your parents? I never heard you talk to them that way. And you're always looking out for one another. Now having said that, our topic is why we can't be friends. So let's start with the first troublesome point of this topic, which is friendship between guys and girls, men and women. I don't know how, how else to say it, but it's just simply not going to happen. <laughs> okay, that's enough for me to finish with this point and move on, but I'm supposed to elaborate further. There are literally dozens and dozens of experiments and articles written on this topic. I mean, you can Google it, you can YouTube it. So many that psychologists and therapists have discussed of whether or not opposite genders can actually remain as friends. They can actually remain acquainted with one another. And I'm sure a lot of you here, you've seen some of these videos of guys going on college campuses and doing social experiments, asking people and students, if you have a guy friend or a girlfriend, can you remain uh, best friends with them? And I think like 90% of them said, no, I can't actually. Whenever I'm with my best friend who's a girl, I always think of her as more than that, but I'm never going to tell her that. And you see, this is the problem, because one of the issues that come about of this opposite gender friendship is that you put your iman at risk. And the problem with that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us what? An ayah, an ayah that is absolutely one of the most powerful verses in the whole Qur'an. وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina. إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا 
Now this is an ayah that's usually quoted for extreme cases. But what this ayah is telling you and I is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't get close to zina. He didn't say, wala tazayyanu. He says, don't get close to it, which means that there are surrounding factors that lead somebody to commit the spiritual crime of zina. And then Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't have to, because if He says, kun fayakun, that's sufficient for us. But Allah Azza wa Jal now tells us why you shouldn't get close to zina. Innahu kana fahisha wa sa'a Two things you always have to remember. Number one, that path that you're about to take that's reminding you and causing your brain and your imagination to be stimulated in the haram way. All of us know what, we're ta- what I'm talking about. I don't want to elaborate that any further. Allah Azza wa Jal says, this path that you're taking, what it's going to do is number one, it's going to cause you to become fahish. And fahish is generally a term used to describe shame. You're going to develop this level of shame amongst people. That this is where the attitude begins, where people start judging each other by the way they look, by how big their nose is, how kind of lips they have, and they start losing this content that Allah had blessed them with. They lost it because of the choice of friends and company they surrounded themselves with. And, and then Allah Azza wa Jal continues and says, well, if that's not the case, if you don't develop shamelessness in that friendship, okay, fine. Because a lot of people would argue that, Brother Musa, I'm just acquainted with her. She's just my colleague. She's just my classmate. Like, what's the big deal? Okay, fine. Wasa asabila. Sa from the word sayyi. It's an ugly path. Don't take it. Now, having said that, I know, including myself, everyone, most of us sitting in this audience, we have acquaintances or friendships with the opposite gender. So what is Brother Musta telling you to do right now? Now here are some guidelines, inshaAllah ta'ala, that you can use. Understand number one, nowhere in the Sharia are you prohibited to talk to the opposite gender. This is a general principle. Any student of knowledge knows this. How you engage and how you talk to the opposite gender is where the problems begin. It can either run smoothly for you or it's going to be a disaster. But that interaction with the opposite gender is never cut off or prohibited in and of itself. Having said that, all of that comes from one verse, or actually two verses in Surah An-Nur. Allah Azza wa Jal says in verse number 30 and 31, just the introduction I'm going to give you. Allah Azza wa Jal says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ That's verse number 30. Verse number 31 starts off the exact same way, except it's addressing the females. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغُضُّدَنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنْ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُمْ طيب. Both of these ayahs or ayatain are calling to the, to the following. Number one, they are calling to believers. The ayah doesn't say, قُلْ muslimin. It says, mu'minin. Say to believing men, say to believing women. It doesn't say, say to Muslim men and Muslim women. So the first lesson that you can test your acquaintance or your relationship with the opposite gender is, where's your iman? in that relationship? Do you find that your iman is unstable in the sense that when you're not with that person, you can focus, you can do all the right things, you're disciplined in your deen, but as soon as that person comes into your life, whether they come via WhatsApp, via Facebook, or they're actually standing in front of you, do you forget your priorities and your discipline in front of Allah? So instead of the conversation starting off, Salaamu Alaikum, do you have the assignment ready? Or are you going to be at work? Can you take over for me? Instead of the conversation remaining upon subject, something that is permissible, it starts going like this, Salaamu Alaikum, oh my God, I saw the abaya you wore today, Allahu Akbar. Then he's saying the same thing, or she's saying the same thing. The way you recited Quran today, oh my God. 
if it starts going in that direction, you have a problem not with her. You have a problem not with him. You have a problem with your iman. This is why you ever find yourself parents here. You ever find yourself when you ha- try to have these conversations with your children, you tell them about, you know, it's you, I don't want you to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and not even a friendship in that manner. I want you to be careful. And you give them all the ayat and hadith you can imagine. And when they're done, they go and they pick up their phone and they call their girlfriend and be like, you're the only one that gets me. My dad always lectures me. My mom, same thing. But you, you never do that. This is a problem with your child's iman. There's a bankruptcy, there's a cut off, there's a problem with their connection and how they connect with Allah. They don't understand these rules, these principles. They don't understand. They are not grounded with, with why these rules and principles are set in stone for them. So how do you solve that? You're going to have to go back and start over again. And how you start over, use the template of Luqman alayhi salam. Use the advice of Luqman alayhi salam to his son. All I'm going to mention to you is how he began his advice. What's the first thing Luqman alayhi salam said to his son? He calls his son, Ya Bunay. So he respects him. So the first thing you have to do is what? This is the biggest problem that keeps someone like me very busy in my office. Is so many parents, I know they have good intentions. I'm not picking on them. I'm one of them as well. So I know you have good intentions that when you try to address these issues with your children, that sometimes you might scream and yell or be like, are you crazy? I never did that. When your, well, your grandparents never did that. Where we grow up, we never did that. What's wrong with you? And you put your child down without knowing the consequence, without knowing the consequence of your choice of words, because remember, you're their hero. At the end of the day, they're supposed to be inspired by the same people that's putting them down. It's not going to work. Luqman alayhi salam called his son, Ya Bunay, Oh my beloved son. So you can translate whatever, Oh my beloved child means in your language. And the first thing that he tells his son is, لا تشرك بالله. Don't you dare commit any shirk with Allah. Why does he start off with that? This is not just a lesson on aqidah, sciences, or belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also a discipline. Luqman alayhi salam is telling his son, what I'm about to say is all going back to who's in charge. It's Allah's rules, not mine. You know, if we had our way, and I'm only speaking like this, once upon a time I couldn't. But when I became a parent, then I realized why parents give their child everything. And if we had it in our control, whatever your child is happy with, you'd want to give it to him or her. Am I correct? You remember when, at least for myself, back in the early 1800s when I was a kid, I remember... Allah, Jazakallah khair. Anyhow. So back in the days when I was a kid, the whole world, and for all of us as well back then, the whole world was all about us. It was all about what we want when we were teenagers, what made us happy. We didn't care about no one else. But then when you became a parent, your whole life is all about your children. You stop with what you want now. You'll do anything to make your children happy. Sometimes if you're not under control, what tends to happen is you start to give them more than what they deserve or what they need without realizing the consequence. So the first point in understanding why you can't have this kind of friendship with the opposite gender, if you don't see it today, you'll see it later on the consequence of that choice. Because shaitan is evil. And shaitan loves that relationship no matter how dignified or civilized you think it can be. And so what scholars teach us is when you have relationships or friendships with the opposite gender, 
keep it business related, whatever that business is. You have to be extremely cautious because in our culture in 2016, this concept is one of the most difficult ones for people to swallow today. It's just like being good to parents. Mothers and fathers, you remember back in the days when your dad told you to do something, you just سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا Even if he told you to marry someone, you just accepted it and did it? But in today, when you tell a child to do something, why? He never did anything for me. Why should I listen to him? So what used to be the most straightforward, simplest command is now one of the most difficult ones. So this is the same idea. I know that when I'm saying this to you, generally as an audience, for some of you, it's strange. For some of you, it's almost impossible. For some of you, you might come up to me and argue with me and say, you know, Brother Musa, this is Canada. <laughs> this is the culture. We need to be with each other. I get it. I live here too. I work here too. I go to school here as well. I know it. I'm in the same battle zone as you are. But I'm saying to you is when you can control how you think and what you look at, then you will control what you do. It all starts off with your eyes. If he or she is more than a friend through your eyes, then this is an indication you need to slow down or you need to stop. You need to take a break from that kind of friendship. It's not going to go away, so I'm not going to give you these unrealistic goals and say to you, you cannot have friendships with the opposite gender. You cannot interact with the opposite gender. I'm simply not going to do that. And as a matter of fact, our sharia or our religion has never done that. The messenger alayhi salatu wasalam he spoke to women, and as a matter of fact, he addressed them face to face with some of the most intimate issues. They would come up to him and ask him, Ya Rasulullah, how do I purify myself after my menstrual? How do I do that? And they're looking at him face to face. You know how awkward that can be? And you know what the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam did? He answered her. He answered her. He, gave, he didn't say, don't you, don't you have any shame? I'm the Prophet of Allah. What are you doing? Didn't do any of that. He answered her question. So clearly, there is interaction permissible, but there's a limit. Because that same hadith narrated in Bukhari, this woman didn't understand his answer. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, kaif, how? How do I clean, clean or purify myself? So he repeats himself a second time, telling her, you need to do A, B, and C. Then she said, Ya Rasulullah, kaif? She asked a third time because she still didn't get it. That's when he said, go ask Aisha. Go ask my wife, she'll explain it to you further. Clearly there was a limit. That's your key to this kind of friendship. Otherwise, you can't be friends. It's not for you. You're not ready for that. So that's why, having said that point, the verses that I chose in Surah Al-Furqan, kind of gives you a glimpse of the consequence of why people fall into trouble with these kinds of friendship. And it also introduces the second category, which is why we can't be friends with anybody we want to or desire to call a friend. You have to look for certain qualities in an individual before they qualify to be your friend. You can't be friends with just anyone. We know that just by sheer common sense. So these verses here give us a glimpse of how to do that and the consequences. So now we're going to go into a journey to the hereafter and that's where we'll end insha'Allah ta'ala. In reality, but also in the lecture as well, okay? <laughs> Allah Azza wa Jal says, On the day of judgment, this man is going to come. You know when you're nervous, or some people when they're nervous, they go like this, Ugh, Oh my God, oh my God, my interview is going to come up. Oh my God, it's my turn to go speak. Ugh. And they're nervous, and they start chewing on their nails. Well, on the day of judgment, this one individual, whoever they are, is going to actually chew on their knuckles. So this is the most severe of severe. That's the image Allah puts in front of you to start thinking about and look at how this discussion continues. So that's the image that I put in front of you. It's pretty scary. So Allah Azza wa Jal continues. يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا Look at why this individual is chewing away at their knuckles. He says... 
يا ليتني يا ليتني اتخذت مع الرسول سبيلا هي سيز او هاو اي ويش how i wish and how i desire that i had taken this other individual ma'a rasul sabila who was with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and on his path in other words how i wish i chose good friends friends that respected me respected my way of life respected my choices as a muslim respected who i was how i wish i chose those friends because now on this day i can see why i needed them the problem with choosing friends is people who are careless in that process don't think about the consequences of their choices they don't think well 5 or 10 years what kind of friend is this going to be for me how am i going to interact with this individual i need to see some potential in my relationship with this individual listen to what i'm saying It sounds so foreign especially in our culture because we're taught uh, anybody who gives you a little bit of attention just go with the flow it's all good but Islam or at least our religion taught us no 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 you have to be more critical than that this is why Allah says afala ta'qilun don't you think don't you reflect and he doesn't say that just in one circumstance he says that as a general rule the muslim is an intelligent individual I bet you if I put a chair on this stage and I said to all of you look at the chair I can guarantee that some of you in this audience is going to find that very beneficial you're going to find some faida well let's see let's see what what do I find out of this chair some of you will get the best sleep of your life I'm sure but others you'll find your look and you'll find those benefits if you wash your car you'll find benefit in that if you take calculus or shakespeare inshallah one day we'll find benefit in that right so the point is is that all the things you think might be useless a muslim's intellect causes them because they are thinkers because their brain never sleeps they always find good and beneficial things in everything So the first step or guideline that we have to take from verses like this is you have to stop man and look around you and the company that you have what kind of company is that this is for adults as well don't think this is a talk just for the young people the biggest crime i can commit right now is speaking to you and the adults aren't taking this seriously don't do that to yourself as a matter of fact this topic was actually inspired to me by adults they are the ones that came up with this whole concept of okay who should we choose as friends and why can't we be friends with certain individual you think young people came up with this topic young people are trying to avoid this topic they don't want to listen to this they don't want to hear that reality so that's the first lesson now listen to what happens the regret and the remorse is already there so it's kind of over but then look what happens next allah azza wa jalla continues ya waylata laytani lam attakhidh fulanan khalila now this individual is so disappointed he starts cursing at himself arabs use a term wail and wail means to really put yourself down and you're shamed like how could you allow yourself to do such a thing so on that day the same person because of the choice of friends they had they say to themselves how could i do this so they're chewing on their knuckles and at the same time they're st- they're talking to themselves what kind of life did i have man every time it was salat time my boys used to tell me no 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 forget that bro let's just go just tell your parents you did it every time my mom would tell me that i need to put that hijab on i did until i got to school until I got to my friend's house every time my parents sent me to the masjid for my evening madrasa little did they know i never made it to one session because i was going somewhere else and doing my own thing ramadan is around the corner parents your responsibility in ramadan and the mature young people here watch out for your children who are not praying either near you or literally beside you if you can't see them then be critical of yourself be honest with yourself don't say to yourself well he's probably in a corner somewhere praying tahajjud by himself don't do that 
Because don't be surprised that they're standing outside with Timmy's with a bunch of their boys, and then when Taraweeh is done, they sneak in for Salatul Witr. Don't, don't be surprised. So many kids do that. And if you go to Taraweeh, you'll see, you'll see who's hanging outside when Taraweeh is happening. So be very responsible. And you young people, this is the problem for you young people sitting in this audience. You got to take this stuff seriously, man. You got to take this stuff seriously. Because you always, and every one of us, the adults understand this, but for the young people, you have to constantly be reminded, and that's okay. You're going to die, and you don't know when, and you don't know how. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Don't you dare die or leave this world unless you are in the state of Muslim. You know what that verse is really saying? If you're sitting outside with your boys and they're all smoking and drinking or doing or whatever and having a good time, or you keep clicking that mouse and watching the thing you're not supposed to watch, or you keep doing just complete haram, defiant to your parents, that moment, if death comes to you, it's not going to say, oh wait, you're having an argument with your parents, I'll come back when you're in a good mood. Oh wait, you're watching a haram movie, I'll come back when it's Quran time. That reality is always watching. And if you still aren't convinced, go to a cemetery and look at some of the dates on some of those graves. They'll, they'll say the person was born in 1950 and died 2016, but then beside it, there's somebody who was born 2015 and died 2016. One year, Allah gave them in this world. How long do you have? And so these verses here, and I conclude inshallah ta'ala, the person eventually admits, لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي عَنِ الذِّكْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ جَاءَنِي وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا They said, this friend, all they ever did was misguide me, steered me in the wrong path, made me live a path of shame, made me make all the wrong choices, destroyed my relationship with my wife, with my husband, with my children, with my parents, with my community, with my imam, with my teachers. All of those people were lost because I chose these kinds of friends to be around who just told me, bro, do whatever you want. Feels right, just do it. So it's like a bunch of Sprite cans just rock, walking around. You just do whatever feels right. Quench your thirst the way you want to quench it. Just do it. That's the kind of company. And so the biggest regret on that day, and this is what I conclude with my brothers and sisters, the Messenger alayhi salatu was salam is going to complain to Allah and say, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ He will say, Oh my master, إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا My people, they took this Qur'an. هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا they took this Qur'an, now the word that's used is hadha, which means something right in front of you. The Qur'an is right here. It's right in this auditorium. But it's coming to you in a lecture form. It's coming to you through other forms of reminders. The Qur'an is right in front of you. But what happened is some of those individuals, they made hijrah away from that Qur'an. They made hijrah. They didn't just turn their back. They actually walked away from it. And then they tried to make a hijrah back to it when Ramadan came, when Friday prayers came, when something else came. And at that point, it was too late. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He told us, You're on a conveyor belt, and you're moving forward. No matter how you twist and turn your destiny, it still keeps going forward. There's nothing you can do. That's why we can't be friends with just anybody we want. We have an ultimate goal and an ultimate reality that we're preparing for. I just want to conclude with something aside from my talk and my topic for you today. And I just want to quickly, for the last 30 seconds or so, address and put my heart out for those victims and those, those people, those passengers on the Egypt air flight and this is, wallahi, one of the most heartbreaking things because I just arrived from India last night. And uh, I got that news whilst I was sitting in the hotel room in India. Can you imagine what I was thinking now that I'm going to get on a plane and fly almost 20 hours here? This is all that's going through my mind. And I started saying farewell. I had to do it just for my own sanity. I had to start saying 
goodbyes to my family and to my children. I asked all of them to pray for me. I started WhatsApping everybody I knew, just make dua for me, pray for me that I get there and I get there safely. Because it really woke me up as a person who lives on a plane and I travel so often, I have to be up there and all I can depend on in is مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَّا Rahman. Nothing is holding this thing in the sky except Ar-Rahman. Those people on that plane, they weren't on the wrong flight or on the wrong airline or at the wrong place at the wrong time. That was Allah's qadr upon them. But it's still so sad and so shocking that that quickly they were 45 minutes away from landing at their destination that quickly whatever they said and whatever they were doing that was the last thing they could submit to Allah and it's time for them to go on trial and the second and the final thing is you all know what's happening in Fort Mac brothers and sisters the reason why I'm concluding this way is Life is extremely short and it's too short to be stuck in problems and issues with families and grudges and hating one another and all of these issues because at the end of the day, that same problem in Fort Mac, why isn't it coming here or coming to Toronto? Why did it happen here? Allah sparked a fire in that part of the world. Why not here? It's because Allah has mercy and He's saving us for something else. Our time will come, but maybe not through that route. It's going to come somewhere else. So what I want all of us to take as a lesson why these tragedies are happening is if you're still sleeping, it's time for you to wake up. If you're still sleeping, start waking up and wake yourself up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. And if that is not waking you up, you have the best alarm clock of the year just around the corner. Take advantage of it and set your life on a proper alarm clock that is disciplined and obedient to Allah. Life is too short and we simply don't know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take our life and we're finished. So I want to conclude that may Allah azza wa jal reward and bless us for our sacrifice and our effort. May Allah azza wa jal make it easy for the families of that flight. I don't know what it feels like. I can't even imagine when that plane is going down and those passengers who are probably drinking water, one of them is sleeping, one of them is on their iPad and everything in a split second turns into a chaos. What was happening in those last few seconds before that plane went into the sea? What is happening when those people who built their lives and their homes in that area in Fort Mac, knowing that there was a fire bigger than mountains coming their way and there was nothing that they could do. They were people just like you and I and now they have to start all over again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them and ease their pain and their suffering. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.